Alright, Unit 7, glycogen. First thing to note is these terms, because they all kind of look the same. Uh, glycolysis, which is the title of Unit 3, which is glucose to pyruvate. It would help just to review that unit a little bit. It's very similar and it ties in a lot to uh, glycogen. Glycogenolysis. Lysis, meaning degrade. So every time I saw this, I would just like cross out this word and write degrade on there. So I would know to go to my deg uh, degrading, degradation pathways. So that's going from glycogen, degrading it to glucose. So glycogenesis is just the synthesis of it, going from glucose to glycogen. A quick review about glycogen. It's going to be written like this a lot, glucose in parentheses with an N, um, just meaning it's a bunch of glucose molecules, there's some number of them, it doesn't really matter. 90% uh, of glycogen is linear, alpha-1,4 linkages, and 10% of it is branch, alpha-1,6 glucose linkages, and we're only talking about the liver and the skeletal muscle throughout this whole unit. So in things like reviewing unit 3, it helps to remember your glute families, specifically if you see glute 2, think liver, glute 4, muscle. So we're going to keep coming back to this as we go through these different pathways, but you, this is your glycolysis and then this is where glycogen comes in mostly. We'll talk about the little exception there. We'll come right back to that. The first thing we're going to talk about is degradation. Both liver and muscle start out degrading glycogen in the same way. And then they each handle it a little bit differently from there. So when you're talking about glycogen deg degradation, you need to remember that the linear and the branched go two separate ways. So we'll start with the linear route. You have your glycogen here, and you're using glycogen phosphorylase to break it apart. So phosphorylase is attaching a phosphate on to the terminal glucose, and then that glu then it attaches to the one position on that glucose, and it pops off. So that there's your product right there, glucose one phosphate. Uh, glycogen is written as N minus 1, which means whatever, however much glycogen was there, it's lost one glucose. Minus 1, here it is, right here. So we'll come back to that, but both liver and muscle start out the same way. For the branched, you have debranching enzyme, which adds water to it, to the glycogen. So you've lost one glucose and it pops off free. Nothing attached to it, just a free glucose there. So after the first step, your main products are glucose 1-phosphate and glucose from the linear and branched pathways. Before we move on, let's talk for a second about debranching enzyme. It usually comes up in a question. Um, know that it's the bifunctional one of this unit. Um, and the hydrolase activity, it's adding water to the gly glycogen to tear off the glucose. So that's its first job. It's breaking that alpha-1,6 bond, so it can also be called, that first hydrolase activity can also be called alpha-1,6 glucosidase. So if we're looking at what exactly happens there, So this is our linear glucose chain. Each one of these little dots is a glucose molecule. Don't pay attention to the numbers. It's just an example for the activity. So debranching enzyme first breaks this alpha-1,6 linkage. And then instead of having this free floating glucose chain here, the transferase activity is going to take what's left of it and bring it down and attach it to the rest to the end of the linear chain. So that's the transferase activity. 
cuts it, puts it back together so it's easy to keep going rather than have a bunch of glycogen fragments all over the place. Keeping it organized. So first we talked about these being the same. Now we're going to take a look at what happens in both the liver and muscle separately. I'm just going to lay another piece of paper on here with the liver pathway. So let's start with the linear side again. We left off with glucose 1-phosphate. <clears throat> so I'll write that again right here. And the main job of the liver is to give glucose to the blood. Remember, liver associate with GLUT2. That's how it releases it to the blood. We're basically doing glycolysis a little backwards. I'll illustrate that in a minute. But the pathway resumes with glucose 1-phosphate to glucose 6-phosphate. There's phosphoglucomutase again, being the enzyme. And then glucose 6-phosphatase comes in. <clears throat> it's a phosphatase, so it's going to add water. And that's going to free up the glucose so it can be released into the blood. So that phosphatase removes that 6-phosphate there. So it just becomes a free glucose, a phosphate, which no one really cares about. But the important thing to know about glucose 6-phosphatase is that it's the endopla endoplasmic reticulum enzyme. It's membrane-bound to the ER. Grab some water there. Um, the other side is much easier. You've already gotten glucose as a product. Because you have glucose, it's just released straight into the blood. That's the end goal, is to release free glucose. And there you go. So from the linear side, there's just an extra step with the glucose 6-phosphatase. And remember phosphoglucomutase because this is going to be the, the one enzyme that's used in both degradation and synthesis. I'll mention that again when we get to synthesis. So if the goal of the liver was to break down glycogen and share it, release it to the, the blood to take care of the rest of the body, the muscle acts differently. The muscle is a little more selfish, it's going to take the glucose and use it for itself. <clears throat> so we're looking at the same thing before, the same, same way we started both of them, and we're picking up right where we left off with a glucose 1-phosphate on the linear side, and you're going to use phosphoglucomutase again to get glucose 6-phosphate phosphoglucomutase, that's the only thing it does. It can go either way, changing 1-phosphate um, and 6-phosphate back and forth. And then you go through the glycolysis steps and get pyruvate. It's almost the same thing on the other side, except you started with this free glucose. And then, then you're, you're going through glycolysis from the very beginning. So this gly glucose to pyruvate is the exact same as unit 3. So make sure you're familiar with all those enzymes and those steps. Remember this is the muscle, so if you see glucokinase, which is only in the liver, he's trying to trick you. So watch out for glucokinase. It's hexokinase only in the muscle. So make sure you have both of those pathways written out for how it uh, starts out the same liver and muscle and then ends up differently. To review glycolysis for the ATP yield, remember in steps 1 and 3 you have to spend an ATP on the kinases, but then in steps 7 and 10 you get two ATP back. So if there are questions about the ATP yield of muscle glycogen, 
it depends on where it's coming from. So 90%, this is the linear side over here, you're skipping that step one. Put up the whole pathway again. Because you start with this phosphate from glycogen phosphorylase, you didn't spend one on hexokinase. Because you skipped step one right here, you didn't lose that one, so you get plus three ATP rather than plus two ATP. The other side was glycolysis exactly, so it's the same, plus two ATP. Let's review real quick what we just talked about. So when we degraded it in the liver, the goal was to get glucose into the blood. So we started here with glycogen, and the linear pathway, uh, so linear, or the 90% of it, starts at glycogen here, went to glucose 6-phosphate, into glucose, and then out GLUT2. 10% of it went straight to glucose, and out into the bloodstream. When we degraded it in muscle, 90% of it started as glycogen, went to glucose 6-phosphate, and then down through the steps of glycolysis. 10% of it went straight to glucose and had to go through all 10 steps of glycolysis. So that 90% jumps in at um, step two, skipping step one, 10% of it goes through the whole thing. Synthesis is very easy pretty much the same in both of them, uh, just really just memorizing this pathway. So you start with glucose, and the first step is the same step as glycolysis. So step one is going from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. This is going to happen with glucokinase in the liver, hexokinase if it's in the muscle. Then you're going to use phosphoglucomutase to change it into a glucose 1-phosphate. So remember, phosphoglucomutase, both. Both synthesis and degradation. The other thing I'll say, in case I forget later, but it comes up a lot as being the, the non-regulated enzyme. A lot of these have different regulation, which we'll talk about in a minute. But phosphoglucomutase is not regulated. Back in Unit 4, we always wanted the phosphate in the 1 position in order to add UTP, in order to activate it. So there's another uh, enzyme we should recognize from Unit 4, UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase. That's going to activate the glucose here. And then in the last step, glycogen synthase comes along with a glycogen chain that already exists. So you're ac adding an activated glucose onto an existing glycogen chain. So N here, and then you've added a glucose, so it's N plus one. That's really all of synthesis. In order to get it started, you need glycogenin, which is the, the primer, kind of the foundation for what you're gonna start building these linear and branch chains off of. He used to ask questions about this, and I haven't seen him much lately, so that's kind of all I knew about it. Maybe associate tyrosine as being a, the amino acid where the, the binding happens. But that's all I can really say about glycogenin.
Come back to our chart here. So if we are synthesizing glycogen, we're bringing it in through either the oh my greens out, bringing it in through either the liver or the muscle. Pathway is the same. Going through the first step of glycolysis, going through phosphoglucomutase, activating it and adding it to an existing chain, and going to glycogen here. So this is how all the all the pathways connect. It's good to be able to know how to how to draw this out. All right. Let's see, regulation is the last topic. This is kind of a classic. It seems extremely complicated, but I'm going to simplify it in the way that he tends to ask the questions about it. Um, I studied it a little bit more than this and it did me no good. I was looking in the last couple tests and it's usually only a couple questions so if you know the basics of it don't be scared by all the different letters and so many charts he has. Um, if it helps you understand it, great. If not, just, just know this here. So we're starting with two possibilities. You can either be making glycogen or breaking the glycogen. If you're making it, you're obviously using glycogen synthase. If you're breaking it, you're using glycogen phosphorylase. He keeps titling his slides reciprocally regulated. That just means when one's on, the other one is off. So when phosphorylase is on, synthase is off. start on this side over here. Um, glycogen synthase in its active form is dephosphorylated. It's de dephosphorylated, you're seeing that OH there. Don't get confused by the A and the R. Assume they're the same thing. Just assume A means active and A goes with R. So all of these things, I made them all green for go, that means they're, they're all turned on. B and T just mean the opposite, it's in inactive form here. Glycogen phosphorylase, when it's dephosphorylated, is inactivated, or it's in B and T form. So, let's say we start exercising or fasting. PKA is going to be turned on. PKA is going to phosphorylate glycogen synthase which turns it off, brings it to its B and T state, inactivating glycogen synthase. Rather than directly turn on glycogen phosphorylase here, it has a helper. PKA turns on phosphorylase kinase. So PKA added this phosphate right here. And then phosphorylase kinase is the one that adds this phosphate right here. So phosphorylase kinase phosphorylates the phosphorylase phosphorylates the phosphorylase. That's not confusing. But when it turns on, when it puts the phosphate here, it brings it to its active form. A, A R, same thing. You can break up the glycogen. Uh, note that he keeps doing on questions uh, when you're exercising. It's epinephrine, and that can work for both liver and muscle. Epinephrine can. But when you're fasting, glucagon, glucagon is only going to communicate with the liver. So glucagon will have no effect on muscle glycogen. So if you're fasting, the first source you're going to use is breaking up the liver glycogen, not the muscle. You need to be exercising to make up the muscle glycogen. This is really all very similar to step three regulation in glycolysis, that key enzyme step. PKA 
does one thing, PP1 does the other. So after you've exercised, you've broken up some glycogen here by turning PKA. Now we're going to go the other way um, and start rebuilding our glycogen stores. So we've eaten, we've released insulin, insulin's hitman, PP1, and you start making glycogen. PP1 is a phosphatase, so that means it's taking off these phosphates and turning them back into OHs. There's something called insulin sensitive kinase or synthase kinase. I don't worry much about that. I haven't seen it um, on tests, but if you do want to know, I put this in parentheses, it's kind of a little extra thing. But when synthase kinase is in its regular state, um, when it's dephosphorylated, it holds back PP1. So another effective insulin is to release PKB. PKB phosphorylates synthase kinase, and then this one gets out of the way to allow PP1 to do its thing. So that confused you. Don't worry about it. I don't think it'll come up. Uh, like you said, the the regulation is can be very complex because you have two different things, two different types of regulations going on at the same time. But it's hard to ask questions about that. That's a very expert level of biochemistry that I don't think anyone fully understands. Uh, but to know the difference of the, the two types, allosteric is talking about the f actual form of it. So the R form or T form, kind of like hemoglobin and biochem 1. That's mainly related to, to energy charge. And the other type of regulation at the same time is um, hormonal regulation. We get to is active or A state or inactive or B state. And that's the phosphorylation. Phosphorylation and hormonal regulation are kind of hand in hand. Make sure you know this chart really well. I guarantee at least one question will come from, from this chart. Um, so now we're, we're zeroing in on glycogen phosphorylase. So what turns on and off glycogen phosphorylase? The phosphorylase, there's two of them, uh, one that works in the muscle and the liver, and they work slightly different. So high energy charge, or ATP, is going to deactivate it. If you already have energy, you don't need to keep breaking down glucose. So glucose 6-phosphate is also going to inactivate. If you already have glucose 6-phosphate, you don't need to keep making more glucoses. However, if you're exercising a lot and you've broken down a lot of ATP to AMP, that's going to signal the body to keep breaking down glycogen. I put calcium here to, to remind myself. Overall, calcium is going to increase it in muscle. Here's where the calcium actually comes into play. Remember our friend uh, phosphorylase kinase, which PKA activates it's also partially activated by calcium. And that makes sense because calcium is used in muscle contraction so much. So when you're using, um, when you're exercising using your muscles, glycogen is being broken down. It's being signaled by two separate things, both PKA and the calcium. Just know that calcium does not play a role in the liver phosphorylase. Liver phosphorylase doesn't care about calcium. Only muscle phosphorylase. last important thing that comes up quite a bit is that glucose deactivates glycogen phosphorylase in the liver. So the liver phosphorylase is what's called a glucose sensor. So if you, if you start eating, if you're breaking down, um, if you're using your glycogen and you start eating and it senses that there's glucose in the body, it'll stop breaking down the glycogen. Like, we, we don't need to use our glycogen stores, we can just use what, what he just ate instead. Let me think for a minute if there's anything else worth mentioning.
I'm just looking through the, the first uh, or last trimester test. Membrane bound enzyme glucose 6 phosphatase came up first, knowing that um, most of these are cytosolic, but because it's membrane bound in the ER, glucose 6 phosphatase is not cytosolic. It's ER. I did exactly what I recommended doing. Every time you see glycogenolysis, I just wrote down uh, degradation and made sure to put liver for knowing where I was. The liver and muscle are slightly different. I think that's all I got. If you have any questions, you should ask me. And good luck.